Hello, in this podcast, we're going to learn about immunity in particular. We'll, by the end of this podcast, we'll understand how we become immune to diseases. As we learned before, there are three lines of defense. First line of defense is to keep pathogens out of the body. The second line of defense are non-specific de is a non-specific defense, which means that the, that our cells and we, the chemicals that our cells make can attack a variety of different pathogens. And these two lines of defense were covered in uh, the previous broadcast, pre previous vodcast. And by non-specific, that means that a cell, a cell that can attack, say, Salmonella bacteria, is also able to attack another kind of bacteria or a virus or any other kind of pathogen. Today we're going to learn about the third line, which are specific defenses, and also it's where we get into the immune response and how we become immune to diseases. And here, cells and chemicals only attack one kind of pathogen. So in this case, a cell which is able to attack salmonella will not be able to attack, say, a flu virus or, um, or, any, or say, a worm or any other kind of thing. It need one set. It, you need a different cell to attack each different pathogen. Now here is an overview of basic this graph shows an overview of what we're going to be going over this whole in this whole podcast. First you're exposed to a pathogen and an, an antigen we'll see what that is in a moment but basically it's something that provokes an immune response and antibodies are something which you'll see that attacks the pathogen and the response in the immune system, first there is nothing at all, and then you start to get a bit of response and it goes higher up and then we defeat the pathogen, and then as the, since the pathogen is defeated, the number of antibodies that we make uh, go down. So the number of white blood cells or immune cells for this particular pathogen, first they go up and then they go down. And then when we get exposed again, in the second exposure, we get a much quicker uh, response and instead of having like in the first one it took about it took a week to start getting any reaction whatsoever and here it's just like a couple days so it's a much quicker response and also it's uh, a much larger response the fought the attack is much stronger the second time than it is the first time and if you notice if you notice uh, if you that's for the same antigen with a different antigen at the same time, those antigens the are the cells that uh, the antibodies for the f first antigen, antigen X, don't work for antigen Y. So there has to be separate antibodies, separate cells, to attack the other the other pathogen that you see in red there. Now here's the primary response, which we're going to do first, and then we'll do the secondary response. Look at some other things too. So primary, respo primary response is where you're first exposed to the antigen. Now an antigen is a molecule that provokes an immune response. And this molecule is usually a part of the pathogen. It's not the whole pathogen, it's just a part of it. Third line of defense has two armies. There are the uh, T cells that attack the infected cells. And then we also have the B cells that attack pathogens that are not in the cells. So we have two separate armies. One army attacks the cells that are infected and destroys those cells. And the other army goes after the pathogens that are free-floating in the body and aren't yet in any cell. Step one is to find the right immune cell. Now at this point, the, sec the uh, second line defense is active. And actually it's active throughout, but here it's usually being overwhelmed by the pathogen. And in the second line defense, the macrophages and also the dendritic cells are eating the pathogen. And what they do with it is that they display pieces of the pathogen that they've eaten on the cell membrane. So the pathogen that they've eaten is dead, and they've taken it apart, and they've displayed it sort of like badges on there. And, each, and these pieces are called, or some of these pieces are called antigens. And then the macrophage will then search for the B and T cells and looking for the specific ones that match the antigen. And this search can take quite a while because we could have 100 million up to 100 billion 
different kinds of cells that each have a different receptor molecule, the macrophages have to find the correct one, the one that matches, the one that has the correct receptor molecule that matches the antigen. It's like a, a key going into lock. So the macrophage has like 100 billion locks to search for with the key of the antigen. And this can take a while, and that's why in the graph that you saw before, it took, say, seven days for there to start to be a response. When, there was a re when you get the response, that means the macrophage found the right lock. Step two is once the macrophage, and here it's called APC, and AP st APC stands for um, antigen-presenting cell. The receptor molecule does, oh, sorry, the um, macrophage does, and it could be a dendritic cell also, is that they display it and then they find the right cell and here we're showing it with the helper T cell and the helper T cell has the receptor molecule that matches the antigen and they click together and then the macrophage sends out a uh, chemical that then activates the helper T cell and the helper T cell will then um, start dividing, produce more helper T cells, produce memory cells and also send out signals to activate the warriors of both armies. Those are the killer T cells and the B cells. And those cells will then start dividing and also start attacking the pathogen. And how they attack it are different. We'll first, work, first look at how pathogens are attacked outside of the cell. And those involve the B cells. And here I have a diagram showing how they reproduce and how the cells then the cells will change and they can change into memory cells, which we'll discuss later, or they can also pr change into produce pathogen, sorry, produce uh, plasma cells, and the plasma cells produce the antibodies. The reason why they hang out in the lymph nodes is because the lymph nodes come up with, they contact most of the, a, a lot of things in the, throughout the body will end up passing through the lymph nodes before going into the blood. It's very important for you to understand the difference between antigen and antibody. Easy to confuse, not because they're similar, but because the names sound similar. Remember, an antigen is something that provokes an immune response. An antibody is, some, is, one, is the weapon of uh, this part of the immune system. And we'll see in a, on the next slide exactly how that weapon is used. But we produce lots of it, and you see that the plasma cell, and each plasma cell lives for only for just a few days. They produce and secrete up to 2,000 antibodies per second. Now here are the ways the antibodies can attack the pathogens. They are specific in that they only will attack things that have the antigen. Antibodies will only bind with antigens if in the correct one. If something's not the correct one, it'll just ignore it. Neutralization is on you will have, you should sort of like sketch this diagram into your notes and neutralization basically what happens is they bind to the virus the bacteria and what they do is they just they get onto the sites of the virus the bacteria that allow them to function allow them to actually enter the cell they just block up the areas agglutination the if you notice that the antibodies themselves are sort of shaped like Y's and they really are shaped like Y's so they've got and the ends of the Y's are the parts which stick to the receptor molecules or to the antigens. Since there are two of them, one could stick to the antigen of one pathogen and the other could stick to the antigen of another pathogen. And so the sort and so glutenization is where they all come together. Precipitation is the same thing, it's just in this case you've got like a poison or something like that. You don't actually have like like a, a an actual organism. It's just like a toxin. It dissolved in it and when it gets all put together by the antigens we just precipitate out and go from being dissolved in uh, the bodily fluids to becoming solid and the net of result of all of these three things is that it makes it easier for the macrophages of the second line defense to come in and eat them just the antibodies but also the pathogen or antigen with it another thing that the anti that the uh, antibodies can do is that they can tell the uh, foreign cells to, the, to basically uh, explode or lysis. Second army attacks the pathogens that are in the cells. 
And here we have killer T cells, which are also called cytotoxic T cells. They actually, like in the first one, the B cells just stay in the lymph nodes and send out the antibodies throughout the body. Here the killer T cells go out throughout the body and search for cells that are infected by the pathogen. How do they tell? Well, these infected cells have the have the antigen on the surf on their cell membrane. So they find it and then they will um, in, they will instruct the cell to self-destruct or they themselves will poke a hole in the cell making it destruct and when the cell is destroyed so too will the pathogen be destroyed and if not then the antibodies will get it this method is actually also used by our body to attack cancer cells that and those two armies go out and they destroy the pathogens and the result afterwards is that we become immune after we are over, after we get over this disease most of the white blood cells, and remember white blood cells are the cells that are used to attack pathogens in both the second and third lines of defense. And these white blood cells at the third line of defense will then die except for the memory cells. Memory cells live for decades and they're the ones that make us immune. Thanks to them we will never become sick again from that disease so long as the antigen is the same. The reason why we come down with many colds is because, or many flus, is because those pathogens, the flu virus, the cold virus, they mutate very easily. When they, and quite a few of those mutations, the antigens will change. So you're actually immune to many, many cold viruses, many, many flu viruses. Each time you come down with a different flu or a different cold, it's actual it's actually a different cold virus, a different flu virus with a different antigen. Sometimes different uh, pa sometimes different ones will have a different ha sometimes different pathogens will have the same antigen if they're closely related. For example, my um, an my ancestors actually not so much that's going so far back like my grandfather, my great grandfather. They really didn't have to worry about a deadly disease called smallpox because being a butcher was my family business and there's disease you catch from the cattle called cowpox and cowpox is just a very very minor disease the antigen for cowpox is the same as the antigen for smallpox smallpox is a very deadly disease it we don't have to worry about it today because we've basically uh, we came up with a vaccine and we're able to wipe it out we'll learn about vaccines later on in the podcast uh, but by becoming immune to cowpox, you're also immune to smallpox. The secondary response is what happens when you're immune. It can occur years later, you just have to have the memory cells which live for decades. Rather than just having, let's say, one or two cells available like you were before for the, for the macrophages to find, instead you've got many memory cells that are available, so the response can be, will be much, much quicker because it's easier to find them and also these memory cells will reproduce very quickly and they will produce a much much larger army so that they will quickly overwhelm the pathogen before you start to feel any symptoms whatsoever so when you're immune you respond much third third line of defense responds much more quickly so you never and much more strongly so you never ever get sick from it again there are other ways to become immune without getting sick first. Vaccines allow us to do that. And there are basically three types of vaccines. There's, uh, you can be injected by a dead pathogen or a weakened pathogen or a harmless bacteria that's genetically engineered to produce the antigen. Like for example, hep the hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, hepatitis is a virus and there's, they made a bacteria that produces the antigen that, in, that our immune system responds to and it's a harmless bacteria and in both cases with the weakened pathogen dead pathogen we're inject where we have the antigen put into our body but the but there's no way that the pathogen can make us sick like a dead virus or a dead bacteria can't make you sick it's dead and a weakened pathogen usually is a won't won't be able to make you sick 
though sometimes it would. There, are, with those types of things, there is a, take that vaccine. There is a risk you could come down with the actual disease. And what these vaccines do is that they stimulate the primary response. And once you've gone through that, then you become immune. And if you're ever exposed to the real pathogen, then you'll have the secondary response, and you won't even get sick. So why do we need a flu shot every year? Well, the reason why is because there, each year, there is a different flu virus that uh, will be predominant and that, that needs its own vaccine. So the vaccine you take one year is different from the vaccine in the previous year. Two types of immunity. The kind we discussed so far is called active immunity, and this occurs when we have the memory cells for the pathogen. It's long-term. It lasts for decades. And two ways that we've seen that you can acquire it. One is you first catch the disease, and the second way is you get a vaccine. The second kind you need to know about is called passive immunity, and this is short-term. And basically, you just you don't have the killer T cells. You don't have any cells that produce anything. You're just given the antibodies. Antibodies just fight the pathogen if you are exposed to the pathogen. And it's temporary. It only lasts so long as the antibodies are in your body because you're not producing any. Several ways you can acquire it. One is you get a shot with the antibodies, like a gamma globulin shot. Like if you ever go to visit, say, um, Africa, where there are diseases that we're not exposed to here, they'll give you a shot filled with the antibodies. So you'll be temporarily immune if you, say, go to Kenya on a safari. Also, mother's milk contains antibodies. That's why it's important, if you're able to, child, to breastfeed the baby because the, the baby won't get as sick as it would if you were if, it was, if you were feeding with the bottle because with the mother's milk contains antibodies, so the baby will have the mother's immunity so long as the baby's being breastfed. And also, while the baby's in the womb, the fetus is being protected or the embryo is being protected by the mother's immune system because the antibodies are able to cross the placenta and enter into the embryo or fetus. Now we come to our concluding questions. Number one, define antigen. Number two, define antibody. Number three, why won't the antibodies for smallpox work with salmonella? So that's why, why won't the antibodies for one disease work with, or one pathogen work with a different pathogen? Number four, make a box and T-chart for primary response and secondary response. Inside the box, you put the similarities between the two. In the T-box, you've got one heading for primary response, another heading for secondary response, and you just show the differences in the chart. Number five, list three ways to become immune to a pathogen, and the ways can be through active immunity, and it could also be through passive immunity. That concludes this podcast, and I'll see you in class tomorrow.